but um, look, the exchange rate, uh, the exchange rate going up uh, can take can moderate inflationary pressures because a higher exchange rate makes imports cheaper, um, and uh, to some extent that means maybe the RBA doesn't have to do as much with its interest rates. But again, if you actually look at what the RBA has said in justifying its increases in interest rates, it's quite explicit that the mining boom is 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 an important part of that. Yeah. Um, right, uh, a couple of weeks ago, Ross Gittins had an article that said if you don't think you've benefited from the mining boom, you're stupid and you have. Yeah. And so the first, I've got a two part question. The first part is what was he talking about? And the second is, um, who, which country's got it right in terms of mining? Like you hear talk about Norway in terms of sovereign wealth funds and those kind of things and bigger burdens on miners to fund infrastructure and you know social infrastructure. Yeah. So the second part is, is are there countries that we can learn from that have got it right? Yeah, look, Ross, what Ross was focusing on was the exchange rate effect and that, you know, if your salary stays the same and um, uh, if your salary stays the same and the price of imports is getting a lot cheaper, then your plasma TV is cheaper. And I mean, how, God, I'm going to distract myself for a second. There's a fantastic ad on telly at the moment. It's this guy and he's sort of walking along and he's, he's looking a bit broke because it's tough times and he's looking into his wallet. It's like we're all tightening our belt at the moment, but. Luckily, you know, we all have to make sacrifices, which is great because look at this new car for 20,000 bucks. How cheap is that? It's like, yeah, I remember I never thought that when you were broke, you know, <laughs> a, a new car might, uh, might uh, a cheap new car might be your salvation. Um, we've, yeah, we've got this situation now where, yeah, cars are very cheap, TVs, overseas holidays, very cheap. So Ross is right about that, but it's wrong about we've all benefited because. Um, if you're on the age pension, your pension is indexed. Uh, you're, well, if, you, it's, uh, if you're on unemployment benefits, you're indexed. Your pension is in your unemployment benefits are indexed to inflation. If you're on the age pension, uh, your wages are indexed uh, to wages. If you're on the minimum wage, uh, the um, when the minimum wage is adjusted, uh, it's typically adjusted in line with inflation. So anyone who's on a low indexed income. When, when inflation falls, because imports get cheap, we just don't give you as big a pay rise as you were going to get. So anyone who's on an indexed income is effectively structurally prevented from benefiting from the mining boom. Because the cheaper the imports get, the, 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 the lower the pay rise we give them. So it's not true uh, that, that, that we all benefit in that way. Um, as for as for um, countries that get it right, look, I think uh, you know uh, a sovereign wealth fund makes enormous sense. Just put simply, a sovereign wealth fund is the idea that you take money out of the mining boom, and and some people might not like the idea here, but rather than go spend the money on the infrastructure you want, the purpose of a sovereign wealth fund is to park the money in other countries' assets, because that pushes your exchange rate back down. So it means you can have the boom without the exchange rate appreciation because rather than all the money flowing into the country and driving up the exchange rate, you're actually taking some of it and sending it offshore. Um, so sovereign wealth funds uh, make a lot of sense. They don't have to be all uh, put overseas, but they, they do help. Um, Norway seems to, uh, they seem to have got it right for historically very lucky reasons because no one else seems to have, you know, done nearly as good a job. But the model's out there, and I think it's interesting in Australia. I think there's a lot of interest in the policy community for things like sovereign wealth funds at the moment, and I'm, I'm surprised there's less political interest in it. I, I see a lot of unusual suspects lining up to support them. Time for a couple more questions. Oh, sorry. Um, mining seems to me to be a very... Uh, uh, distinct uh, process of capitalism and uh, corporate interest. Therefore, why would they be concerned about taxes for the normal citizen? I mean, the point is that they're there and there for the business, and that's it. And going back to colonial days, you could say, you know, the colonial people were in the, for the business, whether they did it through slavery or whatever purpose. Yeah. So, you know, it's sort of... Uh, uh, the alternative might be, oh, I think, that perhaps uh, the Australian government to invest in mining and things that are opportunities for the nation, do, do some real nation building. 
Oh, look, I'm, I, I don't disagree. I mean, the mining industry is there to make a profit. It's just making far more profit than even the greediest miner ever thought it was going to make. Um, I don't think that they're too concerned about that. Uh, but I, I do think that the public doesn't quite understand either the magnitude of these profits or the exaggerated claims about how I'm better off because of their boom. And, and you know, put simply, the mining boom is a micro, you know, from a microeconomic point of view, there's a huge boom going on. And if we look at the mining industry in isolation from everything else, we see this huge boom. But when we step back and look at it in the context of the macro economy, we find both that the mining boom is big in percentage terms from a small base, but small across the whole economy. But more concerning, I think we see that the boom in the mining industry is actually just crowding out activity in other sectors. So, so we've just got these disparate stories being told. And yeah, I mean, you know, the, the, the miners are a special case of capitalism, um, but they're, they're a wonderful case for people who want to tax the bejesus out of them because if anyone can threaten to go offshore, it's not the mining industry. I mean, the, the beautiful thing is if they went, well, I'd be happy uh, and the resources would still be here. So, you know, they've got less bargaining power than any other industry but they're getting away with more than every other industry. Sounds like there's an insult coming. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> um, but there are many ramifications. But I, I, first of all, I'd like just the word Abbott hasn't been mentioned, the name Abbott hasn't been mentioned. And I think he's part of the story, an essential part of the story about the dynamics of how the treasury scheme is overthrown. And, and that story needs, needs to be told. Um, and it's not being told. I don't think it is being shared home to have a um, responsibility for what, what's, what occurred in that regard. Um, I don't, uh, I'd also... Uh, you mentioned the figure of 160 billion. The magic figure of 160 billion. Um, that, that I take as the difference between the proposed scheme and the current scheme yeah. in terms of um, of the diminished flow of, um, of revenues to the government. Yeah. But the but the other the other uh, uh, number of great interest is, is the extent to which some part of that is flowing, is flowing overseas, and you mentioned that as well. But it would be good to quantify how much is the economy losing in terms of profits that are going overseas. How many million dollars? Um, I wonder too if there is any mechanism by which, um, by which the uh, industry has expanded as a result of this tax regime now applying, rather than the Treasury recommended, uh, with its consequent effects on uh, on the real exchange rate to the detriment of, of the rest of the economy. Given that, in principle, the tax is uh, supposed to not influence outputs, but just to redistribute profits to the government um, and to the economy. Uh, and just to put a clarification on um, the present scheme as it operates, um, uh, is, a, is, it, is it a watered down version of, of a resource rent tax, or does it have virtually no elements of a resource rent? Yeah. Oh, and I think also mentioned, what mentioned, this is historical. Australia, I'm going to forget the first bit of your question. <laughs> <laughs> Australia has a history of applying resource rent taxes to the mining sector, mainly the oil and gas sector, and that, uh, that dates back some decades. In fact, in some respects, we may have led the world in doing it. Um, how is it that that, that point's been neglected? <laughs> Yeah. All right, well, just, just quickly, and we'll have to wrap up in a minute, but um, yes, Australia has a history of doing uh, mining, of resource rent taxes. Um, the petroleum industry from the early 70s in particular, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, but huge tax concessions are still available. The, uh, 
the the MRRT, the proposed tax, conforms to a pretty standard but very narrow version of a resource rent tax. But it, the base the base is narrow and the rate is low. Um, uh, as for the, the sort of the foreign share of uh, of those um, those lost profits, we'll just multiply the numbers by 83 percent. For that 160 billion in lost revenue, um, 83 percent of that uh, would um, uh, would be expected to uh, to, to benefit um, foreign owners of, of Australian resources. And, and look, I don't you know I don't really like. I don't really care much for Australian billionaires or American billionaires. It's not really about their nationality. It's actually about a fair return for Australia's taxpayers for Australian resources. It's not so. Uh, there are macroeconomic consequences from the ownership, but I guess uh, it's it's for me the juxtaposition between the claims for national benefit and the overt, you know, the obvious fact that in fact it's it's not even Australians that are that are gaining the most, but. You know, even if Australian sh even if Australian mining companies were 100% Australian owned, we still should tax them fairly, because they never actually bought those that coal office. They never bought that iron ore office, and it's pure windfall gain that um, uh, that the that the current the, the, those that are currently extracting it uh, should get all of uh, the windfall profit. All right, one more question. Oh wow, then all the hands shoot up. <laughs> Do you have any feel for what proportion of the 200,000 jobs in mining going to people who've been brought in by mining companies under special visas and what proportion might be people who'd be otherwise unemployed? Yeah, look, very good question. The short answer is no, but let me reflect on something related. The mining industry employs 200,000 people. Uh, Australia is bringing in more than 300,000 people a year in an immigration program that we're told is required to fill a skills gap in the mining industry. I'll repeat that, the mining industry employs 200,000 people and we're bringing in 300,000 people a year and we're often told it's because this, the demand for labour with the mining boom. It's ridiculous. Um, uh, so uh, Bruce Chapman, Professor Bruce Chapman at ANU, we published some work of his recently, he pointed out that the 26 percent of miners quit their job each uh, quit the industry each year it's very 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 high turnover we point out in the research we're doing that it's only about a thousand new apprentices employed in the mining industry this year so the mining industry boo-hoo it's got a skills shortage it's not training many people ha a quarter of its workforce leaves the industry every year probably because they don't like their job and they're running around saying, can we, somebody please solve our skills crisis? Well, why don't you try training people? Or why don't you try having better jobs that people don't hate and want to quit all the time? Um, so, yeah, look, I don't know what percentage would be uh, on, on, on these uh, different visa classes, but my hunch is not nearly as many as we probably suspect for the simple reason that the industry just doesn't employ that many people. All right, I'm going to thank myself now. <laughs>